Welcome to year two of A Mick, A Mook, and A Mike. Hosted by four-time Emmy Award-winning producer, Frank Pace. And retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet, Billy O'Connor. Brought to you by We Can Coffee Company. Manufacturer of freshly roasted premium coffee blends delivered directly to your door. This week's guest, the most accomplished female broadcaster of all time and member of Professional Football Hall of Fame, Leslie Visser. My brother. My brother, Frank, how you doing, pal? You playing any golf? How's your waggle? How's everybody going? My waggle's fine. <laughs> I'm really excited today. We got a great guest. Uh, who's our guest, Billy? Uh, Leslie Visser. I'm excited as well. I mean, this is uh, she's some groundbreaker. Unbelievable. I mean, uh, only woman, she is the only woman, or definitely the first woman in the uh, Hall of Fame, the NFL Hall of Fame. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Amazing well, how many glass ceilings she broke. She broke a bunch of them, that's for sure. So she'll be on with us in a little while. Uh, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. It's your world. I'm just living in it. It's, uh, whatever you think. I, uh, no good news in the, no good news on the COVID front. I'm looking at that all over Louisiana and Florida, grief, but. I don't want to talk about grief. I can't even watch the news anymore. There's so much garbage. Yeah, it. that's true. That's true. Why don't you read a passage from our book? Hey, it is an idea. <laughs> you know what? What? I'll pick one at random. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do anything rehearsed, Frank. Yeah. I'll just pick this one at random. Well, here's a bookmark, interestingly enough. All right. Uh, there's a reporter talking to Lenny Dawson, who was the Kansas City quarterback. Well, he wasn't a Kansas City quarterback then. He was the Dallas Texans quarterback then. If you remember the book, you Egypt. <laughs> What's the time for Egypt? <laughs> Mook. <laughs> exactly. He was the Dallas Texans quarterback. And Lamar had to move to Kansas City because Dallas just wasn't drawing. Yeah. And uh, so an Eagle reporter interviewed Lamar's quarterback, who was Lenny Dawson, later that week. And what did he say, pray tell? He said, Lenny, <laughs> oddly <laughs> enough. Would you comment on the rumor that Mr. Hunt is moving the team to Kansas City? He's, well, I don't know much to say about it. He's, my contract doesn't specify where I play. It specifies who I play for. So the reporter says, is Mr. Hunt uh, moving the club to Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City, Kansas? And Dawson stopped signing autographs and stared at the reporter. Wait a minute. There's two Kansas City? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, there's so many quotes in this book that are funny and they're all public record. I mean, because the characters are so, uh, I mean, well, they're, they're, they're not all public record because we made up a couple of them. We've made up the bedroom scenes, but Lynn Manuel Miranda made up all sorts of scenes in uh, Hamilton the musical that I'm, I'm sure that Hamilton had no blacks uh, in the uh, 1700s and 1800s. So. Well, that's for sure. But, I mean, the dialogue, we made up some of the dialogue. But any of the quotes, they're, they're pretty much public. Right? And the people are large in life. Ali, Frank Sinatra, uh, Tutshaw, sure, you know, they, they were Cosell. Bigger than life. Bigger than life. And, by the way, Leslie probably knows all of them. It, Leslie Visser probably knows all of them. Uh, she certainly knows Cosell. She certainly knows. Well, I tell you, I read a book, and uh, Leslie Phillips, sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. And it's a fine read, Frank. It's a, a really, really good read. If you like sports, it's almost required reading. Like Lamar's Gamble would be if you like sports. I think it's required reading. So the NFL opens up the exhibition game. Did you, see how, did you happen to see the Field of Dreams game? It was on TV. I heard it was a super baseball game. It was, a, it was a super baseball game. It was the biggest baseball viewing audience had in 16 years. It, it did a 5.9. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it did a 5.9. NFL Hall of Fame football game did a 7.3. And 5.9 was the biggest broadcast. So and uh, you're talking about exhibition football. Exhibition. And, and, and it was a ridiculous game. I mean, it was... Uh, it was like who's pitching, you know. There was no scoring in the game, and uh, it was a real low scoring game. As a matter of fact, the last couple of games, the over and under was thirty one, right? What'd you yeah. bet? What'd you bet? I would have bet the under. I would have bet. I made a mind bet, Frank. This way, all I could lose was my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to put cash on it. You know what I mean? I'm not doing that no more. Just my mind. There's nothing. To, hey, tell me that, that before before we get into that. Tell me how your Bitcoin did this week. Hey. <laughs> 
I got out of it, first of all. Yeah, I got, you got out, out of it. it. As soon as I got out of it, it went up 25%. And I started, oh, I said, I'm unbelievable. But then it went down about 10%. So I got back in. And by God, this week, it's up 45%. It's up to 222. You're back in now? Yeah. I got back in. It's up to 222, $2.22. Cents. <laughs> and you know what? I'm starting to think. Let me tell you how sick I am. I'm starting to think is, you know, we had a lot of views last week. And I was mentioning to Claude and I'm thinking, I wonder if I'm influencing the stock, if people are stupid enough to be listening to me, because I know nothing, you know? If you're stupid enough to listen to yourself, you will believe that you're influencing the stock. <laughs> I'm saying, what if people are listening to me, and they've been there buying this stock? But yeah, it's up like 55% this week, 222, and head north. I mean, uh, just a matter of time. And I want to tell you, Frank, right up front, if this stock goes through the roof and I make a lot of money, success is not going to change me. I was just talking to the guy who brushes my teeth this morning. And I <laughs> I don't be the same humble guy. You know what I mean, Frank? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I got to get out of this conversation. <laughs> Before we bring on this week's guest, Leslie Visser, uh, again, I'm pleased to announce uh, our, our sponsor, uh, Weekend Coffee. Uh, they, they have got great freshly roasted premium blends, which, by the way, they deliver straight to your door. So uh, Weekend Coffee is a great sponsor, and we're happy to have them. And we're going to be doing great things with them as we approach uh, September 11th. Well, September 11th, you know, as a first responder at 9-11 and a veteran myself, uh, we can't coffee every 10 packages they sell. They donate a, a bag of coffee to a veteran or to a first responder, which is pretty cool stuff. That's I mean, great. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the philanthropic arm is, 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 is out there. So we're proud to push that call. You bet. Yeah. Speaking of September 11th, why don't we bring on Leslie Visser? Hey, there she is. Leslie Visser. <laughs> Leslie Visser, how are you? Well, I'm not sure. Is this what my career has come to? <laughs> <laughs> that's what Frank said when he met me. That's, that's exactly, that's what, exactly what I said when I met <laughs> exactly. Billy. Is this what my career has come to? <laughs> well, Wait. Leslie, I'm Billy, Billy yeah. O'Connor. And that's Derek, Derek Harris, right? Yeah, it's Harris today. <laughs> actually, actually, I got to ask you a question right off the bat. My full name is William Patrick Michael O'Connor, and I was born in County Cork, Island. And when I read your look, the terrific book, sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. One of the pictures in there is you and Art Rooney in Ireland. And uh, my question to you is, do you still know all the lyrics to Four Green Fields? <gasps> no, but I love By the Fields of Athenry. Can oh, we sing that? Oh, that's a great song. Can you sing By that? a lonely prison wall. I heard a young... Everybody's supposed to join My in. voice is terrible. Hey, is, is, but, this uh, where, is this where my career is coming? <laughs> <laughs> you can't sing any Irish songs. You're out. <laughs> yeah, but my mom was from County Cork. We're the Rebel City. That's Did you Rebel, know that, That's where I was born, the Rebel City. Up Cork, up Cork. The big... Uh, there's a county in Ireland, Frank, called Down. And in all the hurling matches, everybody says, Up Galway, Up Cork. And of course, somebody... Up Down, Up Down. <laughs> <laughs> I've been confused over there. Before we get too far into this, I want to just say that we're so honored to have you here. Uh, you're one of the great sportscasters of all time, male or female. Uh, you're in a lot of Hall of Fames. Uh, you're in the NFL Hall of Fame, Sportscaster Hall of Fame. You broke the ceiling for women everywhere. And it's just an honor to have you. Uh, so it's first, great to be with you guys. And uh I can't decide which of your books I enjoyed more because I'm most associated with the NFL. Uh, the book on Lamar is just fantastic. But all the gossip that's in If These Lips Could Talk, <laughs> or do you think you made up most of the stuff in If These Lips Could Talk? I can tell you unequivocally that I, I left out a lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> That'll be in my sequel, These Lips <laughs> Did Talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we go further, uh, Derek, you have a picture. Uh, I want to ask you as a member of the NFL Hall of Fame, what were they thinking with uh, uh, Peyton Manning's bust? Oh, you know, everyone complains about those always. You see, um, you see the picture we have up there? Uh, no, I don't. Oh. Derek is... <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if he'd appreciate that. If you look quick, it looks like, like him. If, if you, you look, look quick, quick, it looks like him. <laughs> the guy's kind of stepped on the punchline there. Yeah, but that's <laughs> funny. But everyone always complains. I will tell you, it's, it was so astonishing. I got a call from, when I got the call from the Hall of Fame, and 
you know, it's not something, I guess some people campaign for it, but it was so far from ever thinking that ever that I could possibly uh, be qualified and to be the first woman. And they called me up and all I remember saying is, um, okay, you can't take it back. Don't say you have the wrong number. Is this the right place? <laughs> because I was so wow. astonished. Um, the first game I ever saw was in Fenway Park. Remember when the Patriots played in Fenway Park, which, or maybe you don't remember, but Babe Perilli, you guys probably. Babe Perilli, the quarterback? Yes, he was. And it was uh, Larry Eisenhower and Houston Antoine. And, I mean, it was, it was a scream. And uh, they had uh, Ron Burton from Northwestern. He was like their only star. Jim but, Nance? you know, there was the, it was the ragtag AFL that you guys have written about. And uh, because they didn't have a field, you know, Billy Sullivan was one of those old gamblers with, uh, you mentioned Mr. Rooney and Wellington Mara. And so they didn't have a field. And so they, they were like vagabonds. They played at Boston College, they played at Harvard, and they played at Fenway Park, which was BU, or no, when they played at BU, they also had to play on Friday nights because uh, they had the blue laws and you couldn't play on Sunday on a college campus. So they moved to Friday night, and the game that I saw them was against the Raiders in 64 in Fenway Park at night. <laughs> well, yeah, night games. Babe, Babe told me at one time, because Babe was our coach in the WFL. With I worked in the WFL with the Chicago Winds, and Babe was our coach for two games. He, he got fired after two exhibition losses. So, <laughs> and, and he was replaced by Abe Gibran, of course. But Babe and I got really close, and we, we stayed friends up until he passed away uh, a, year, a year or two ago. But he told me they they were in such dire straits that they would used to, they would, they would used to get on the bus for practice and not knowing where they would practice because they would drive around until they found a field, and then when they found a field, they would all get out and then they would run practice. It's amazing. You know, it was really, um, I mean, I was a, a born, bred, and bled Red Sox fan. And the Patriots were just considered, right, 1960. I guess I was six years old. And, you know, we didn't consider them. It was, of course, we waited for the Kirk Gowdy, Al D. Regattas Giants broadcast. But the Patriots were really, they were like a carnival. They, uh, you're right, they ended up practicing in a field next to Logan Airport, you know, and then you couldn't hear anything when, when the planes were going uh -huh. overhead. And they, uh, Billy Sullivan told them not to turn the covers down on the bed because that would, on, on the road, because that would cost an extra $10. <laughs> Sometimes they'd, they'd, they'd fly in the day of a game, you know, to, to play against Buffalo. So it was really um, wild. And, it wasn't that long after that I got to cover the NFL. Wow. You started with the AFL then. That's what, I, I used to go to the night games in the polo grounds to see the Titans on Saturday night. And uh, I think Harry Wisman was worse. He was in worse shape than Billy Sullivan when it came to money. Yeah, they I guess were really running they, the they used to call the box office and they said, we got a Titans game. A guy said, What's the, what time's the Titans game today? And they said, what time can you make it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I even at that Patriots Raiders, you know, it was so much fun because as you guys know, the AFL ball was uh, slimmer than the Duke and it had that little foam padding in it. So, you know, that ball would just sail through the air. And this was Cotton Davidson against Babe Pirelli and Gino Capaletti. And it was so much fun. It ended up in a tie, 43-43, everything <laughs> the AFL has you know, you guys wrote in your book, they threatened the NFL with their high-powered offense. But basically, there was, you know, nobody there at the game. I, I got to my first sideline. I went down and stood next to Jim Otto. Wow. wow. Double O. Double O. That's right. We Billy, had so many, so many. Billy Billy had the under in that game, 43-43. <laughs> Probably. Billy had the under. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my style, Frank. <laughs> I think I really did have the under in the in, in the New Orleans in the uh, LSU game that went to like four overtimes and yeah. the most points ever scored in the college game. I definitely had the under in that, and I had the wrong side of the immaculate reception too. I always remember that. <laughs> so look at this guy running. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Billy, did you bet on like the synchronized swimming in the Olympics? Did you have the Russians? I used to bet on fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I had a real problem, Leslie. <laughs> a real problem. <laughs> but I always went back when I had the good information on fishing. You know, only if I had a tip. So, Le <laughs> Leslie, you uh, you were born and bred in Boston. You grew up a big Sam Jones fan. 
<gasps> he was. He, matter of fact, I don't know if you can see this picture right here. Wow. That's last year with Sam. I started when I was 10 years old on Halloween. I would dress up as Sam Jones, which just shows you how you have to learn color. You know, I, I don't think I could have told you he was black. It just, he was Mr. Clutch. I, you know, I tried to learn the bank shot and I would write number 24 on my little white t-shirt every Halloween. And now I've had the privilege. I know him pretty well. And every year Sam's in his eighties and every year Sam calls me and he says, Leslie, Leslie, please, please don't dress up. Really? You're in your sixties. I mean, come on. And I say too bad. <laughs> well, Sam's a good friend of artist Gilmore, my friend, artist Gilmore in Jacksonville. And Sam lives in St. Augustine now. Uh, and he, artist always keeps me up to date on what Sam's doing and how he's doing. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. Yeah, artist is fantastic. I got to you know, go up there and interview him for. Uh, did you see the show on ESPN, Basketball: A Love Story? Yes, which I was did. Just yeah, I did. And so I, I had about five of those interviews, and one of them was artist. And gosh, I can't believe you knew him well. He's really a gentleman. Yeah, I've known him since 1969, 1969, 1970 at Jacksonville. Uh, at Jacksonville, because I was a student at Jacksonville University. Uh, and that's do you right. remember? Do you remember Drayton Miller, the assistant? I do remember Drayton Miller. Oh my gosh! Drayton Miller came to Boston College where I went as uh, Zuffalato's assistant, and I don't know what kind of players we got with Drayton, but or how you got I don't them, know if... <laughs> or how you got them, right. because Drayton was a little bit, you know, a little, little fugazi. He, he was a little fugazi. <laughs> he was he, he had a, 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 a an open wallet policy right. even back then. You know, I have found, though, that college basketball coaches, for me, um, are just about the most interesting people in sports. I don't know. They, you know, they've got an irony to them, and they all have a sense of humor, especially the New York, the East Coast guys. But I just, I've learned so much from, uh, well, a few coaches. Bill Walsh, of course, was, Bill Walsh studied uh, Muhammad Ali. He coached his team uh, from learning from Muhammad Ali's moves and his quickness and his thinking. And uh, then I got to travel John Madden's bus with him for five years, which you could imagine right. was a trip. Well, well, I want you to tell us a little about Ali. Um, Ali, uh, I only got to, you know, he was sort of failing when um, I got to talk to him, although he did name me um, a Muhammad Ali daughter of greatness, which was a pretty cool thing. And I got the award in Louisville. But uh, it was that his mindset, um, Bill Walsh was an amateur boxer, which most people didn't know about him. And he just loved uh, the idea of the quick strike, which, of course, the West Coast offense was right. a quick strike. Right. And he, he just said that I don't think he ever got to spar or anything with Ali, but he did come to know him. Yeah, because even late in his life, Ali came alive when he started sparring. Leslie said, actually, of all the people she's met, all the fantastic celebrities and sports athletes, the three people she said they really sucked the air out of the room. One was Ali, one was Jordan, and what surprised me, the third one, Dan Marino. Dan Marino. Dan Marino, he um, he tilts the room. Like, you feel him before you see him. Wow. And uh, he just has, you know, 6'4". His first name's Constantine. Most people don't know that. Wow. It's not Daniel. Yeah. So, And he um, he just has such a presence. And the saddest thing, I think, is that he didn't win a Super Bowl. I mean, even John Madden used to say that when he was at practice and he would see Dan throw the ball, that it would give John chills. Wow. I, re I remember uh, Shula saying, they asked Shula one time, how come they're throwing the ball so much? He never threw the ball that much before Miami. And he said, I never had Dan Marino before. Yeah. And it, or, I, or since. Or, <laughs> or since. And ironically, Dan Marino went to the Super Bowl his first year, uh, and he lost that year, and then he never went back. It's, 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 talk about yeah. so many things. So many things have to break your way to win a championship. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it could have been that Patrick Mahomes went to one and we didn't see him again. I mean, it's just, you need so many elements in order to get there. And, you know, Dan just gave his body. I'll tell you, are we off the record? Nobody will see this. Nobody will see this. I'll tell <laughs> <Except> okay. for, <laughs> yeah. Is well, that for sure? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm, wait, I'm sure nobody will see this, Billy. So, um, Dan... 
uh, he, I was on the NFL today three different times, so, you know, three different groups. And uh, one time it was um, uh, Dan Marino, Boomer Esiason, uh, Deion Sanders, and myself. And we used to go to dinner the, the night after the show ended, all the football was over, we go to dinner. And we got talking about how Alvin Harper, I think, was the first player to dunk over the crossbar. It right. was a Cowboy 49er NFC Championship. So we were all talking, and uh, oh, Dion was saying, oh, and I think Shannon Sharp was there, too. And Dion and Shannon were saying, of course they could, you know, they could do that. And I said to Dan Marino, who, by the way, you guys know him, he's not, he's Pittsburgh real. He, he's not boastful. He's just real. And um, I said to Dan, you know, could you dunk? And um, he said, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I could dunk. And I said, oh, come on, because, you know, Dan had that Achilles problem. and We didn't see him get too far off the ground. I said, oh, come on, Dan, really? You could dunk. And he leaned over to me and he said, Leslie, I'm Dan Marino. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, he was drafted in three sports. <laughs> wow. wow. So let me ask you a question because uh, – I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Wilt or Bill Russell? Is that rhetorical? Is that a question? Yeah. Who Who is better? <laughs> That's what I, I expected. That the, I expected that. It's 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 so not even close. One is the greatest champion in the history of American sports, and the other won what one title? So you don't think? Yeah, individually, individually, maybe you won two. Individually, you know, of course you pick Will on your pickup team if that's what you're doing as you would you know you might take Jabbar before you take Russell you know or you might take well maybe not Walton but um you know it's just so ridiculous Walton or uh, Russell changed the game right he controlled the rebound to the outlet and he he ran out of fingers for his rings right back to back college he Olympic did run out gold. Of fingers. He did well, you, you're off from Boston, though, and you did follow those great Celtic teams, so you might be a little prejudiced. Uh, okay, well, here's here's another one. Well, make the argument. Make well, the argument for Wilt. My argument Will. would be that, that Wilt has like 25 or 30 individual records, which is pretty remarkable. I think Michael Jordan Correct. only has five. Uh, 30 individual records, 100 points. He averaged, what, one year he averaged 45 points and 25 rebounds. You know, that's pretty remarkable. But again, they can make a case for Russell. What do but I, know? I, I let her into that question because my friend Gil Vieira is from Boston. We have this argument all the time. So let, let me just get into let me get into this because we're from we're talking about Boston. Who's the greatest hitter you ever saw? You know, they, these are joke <laughs> questions. I mean, really, I grew up with number nine. I grew up with Bill Russell and I grew up with number four, Bobby Orr. That's so the, anyone the, who doesn't that, think that Ted Williams is the greatest hitter who ever lived, just sit at another table. <laughs> Give us that update quote. I love that update quote that I read in the book when they said when somebody wrote a fan letter to Ted Williams. Gods don't answer letters. Gods don't answer letters. He was complaining that he didn't get a letter back, and Updike said, "Gods don't answer letters." So let me ask you another question: Who's the greatest quarterback of all times? Well, uh, it's that's interesting. It's obviously Brady, oh, except so, so we're four until for, we're four for four on Boston. But go ahead. Can I help it that it's the greatest sports? <laughs> in this world? But no, I will say this. That um, John Madden always used to get really red in the face because he felt it was Otto Graham, which people wow. just forgot. But ten titles. Wow! Yeah, and you know who remembers Otto Graham? I mean, there's nobody around. Mrs. Graham. <laughs> Mrs. Graham. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay, now I'll ask you one more thing: Who is the greatest Olympic bobsledder? <laughs> Outside of yourself. Outside. No, that's what I was. I was. I was. I got it I, I for was, you guys. I brought it out. And I, I um, would be really remiss if I didn't mention I saw it. <laughs> it. Uh, it was wild. It was the um, Olympic Games in Albertville, and Herschel Walker was on the team. Remember when Herschel sure. got invited? And uh, so he was on the team, and he said to me, "Leslie, why don't you come down the track with the Olympic team?" And I thought, okay, you know, what a way to go. So um, they had to get permission from Jean-Claude Kili. He had to write a release. And um, I was the third man in the four-man bob. And I just kept my head down. They'd never let women go down it before because they didn't think our trap muscles were strong enough that the G-forces, you know, would whip your head back. So it was all on me. You know, they had no responsibility. 
and CBS put it on the air. Uh, it, it was like, um, I couldn't believe that a minute could last for an hour. Wow. It just went on and on. And Sean McDonough, our great friend, Sean McDonough was on the call. And all you heard Sean saying was, Whoa, 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 <laughs> keep your head down. How fast did they go? How fast were you traveling? Do you know miles per hour? No, I don't know that. It's um in the 60s, 70s. Wow. I'm not sure. It's it's But you got that and pretty good. It's a tin, maybe it's even in the 80s. It's a tin can and it's on ice. No, it must be so much faster. I, I don't think know it's a hundred. I think it's a hundred. I, I do. I, I don't even know that. But you know what? All I could think of is um remember that bob seeger song um i wish i didn't know now what i didn't know then. <laughs> <laughs> you got that pretty good huh? it's like it's like a bullet almost like you're in a bullet you're just close yeah, to 100 yeah it's 93 it must yeah, be even 120 i have no idea yeah, it's it's, and i was derek i was all bruised derek said after it derek said yeah. it's 93 miles an hour as the oh, average thank you so 93 thank miles you. an hour to tin can no wonder you were bruised I was my my legs look like bad fruit. <laughs> so, can you tell us a little about the uh, rivalry between Pete Rosell and uh, and uh, Al Davis? Well, of course, you guys wrote about it. You did such a great job, but it was, uh, as you know, uh, Pete Rosell was like the fiftieth choice, right? It was just kind of uh, they were arguing; they couldn't pick the next commissioner, and. Uh, you know, someone said, well, how about that guy, that young GM? And they said, okay. And I think didn't Al Davis kind of help to broker it? But, um, oh, Al Davis, by the way, where was Al Davis born? Brooklyn. I know. That would be Brockton, oh, Massachusetts. Bro he went to high school at Erasmus Hall, right? Yes, in he, Brooklyn? He did. And did and, With Barbara Streisand. <laughs> I know. And did he have, we, we debate, we found it someplace, but we found that Al Davis had an IQ higher than Bobby Fisher, who also went to Erasmus Hall High School. Is that true? Al Davis was um, terrifyingly smart. He And I, I was really fortunate because his best friend was Lou McDonough, the great Lou McDonough from the Globe. And uh, matter of fact, the reason I got, I was the first woman to cover the NFL as a beat. And the reason I got to do it, I was a young kid at the Globe. And Lou McDonough called Billy Sullivan and he said, Billy, we're going to have a woman on the beat. And that's that. Click. <laughs> wow. So uh, Will was great friends with Al Davis. And so Al, who, as you know, didn't really, he didn't enjoy the company of a lot of people. But I, I got to know him um, pretty well before he died. So uh, that was, yeah, it was a real privilege. He, he saw things, you know, he saw the cat in the picture. He knew that the AFL, remember, he was the first guy to, uh, first they paid more money to the rookies, right? right? They paid which you guys wrote about. And then he sort of invented the hand-holding, didn't he? Where you'd sort yes. of wrap up a guy so that ba no one else could get him. Babysitting. <laughs> babysitting, yes. of which our good friend Upton Bell was an NFL babysitter when he was with uh, Carol Rosenblum's Rams in the early 60s. Isn't Upton a trip? I mean, he he is so much fun. Like, if you're going to have an ideal dinner table, you know, I'd, I'd take, uh, I might take, Doris Kearns Goodwin, but Upton would be one of them. Doris, Doris Kearns, Kearns Goodwin. Goodwin, that's an interesting choice. That's a great choice. I, uh, I was, Will McDonough, you had mentioned in your book that uh, he could actually scream at Pete Rosell on one phone and scream at Al Davis at the other, but his personality was so strong. It's such a, 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 a must have been an unbelievable guy to know because uh, Al Davis actually cried at his funeral. He did. Um, and but just to tell you about Will McDonough, I mean, a couple of things. He was, he was from Southie. He grew up with Whitey Bulger. And we wow. are pretty sure that at Will's funeral, uh, Billy Bulger, who was the president of uh, Boston University and then of the Massachusetts Senate. So Billy Bulger was a pallbearer. And we are sure that Whitey was in the back in disguise, that he came to wow. Will's funeral. I mean, you know. Well, that would make sense. Will, no, Will had gone to visit Whitey when he was in Leavenworth. And Will kept everybody's secret, and he just, um, he knew everybody. Everybody respected him. And remember back then we all had Rolodexes? Sure. So I got at two, the Boston. I, I got two in my office right now. Yeah, well, they were the best. And so when Will would go home from the Boston Globe, all of us would dive under his desk to, like, rifle through his Rolodex. Wow. 
<gasps> no, he was a, a yeah, he was a Trojan. What, uh, what was the first game you covered uh, for the network on the NFL? Uh, well, uh, well, for the uh, I did all the Patriots preseason. I did the Patriots as a beat for um, the Boston Globe, right? And then when I got to CBS. Uh, we were the NFC then, and it was all the NFC East, you know, were great. It was uh, the 49ers and the Cowboys and the Giants and the Eagles and the Redskins. So, you know, it was really a blast then. The The whole NFL was great. And um, CBS made me, uh, in 1992, uh, CBS made me still, or I uh, had the privilege, I'm the only woman who's ever presented the Lombardi Trophy. Uh, and I was so nervous. It was when the Redskins beat Buffalo, right. one of those four Buffalo runs there in the middle of their four. And I remember I was just so nervous, and I had to present it to Jack Ken Cook, the owner of the Redskins. And, you know, one thing you learn early in TV is don't give up the mic. But I did, right? Mr. Cook took it from me. And so all, you know, it goes to 150 countries around the world. And all you heard, because Jack Kent Cook was talking about how he sold Encyclopedia Britannica in Canada, and he owned uh, the Chrysler Building and the Forum. And all you heard was the producer, Bob Stenner, yelling for all the world to hear, get the effing mic out of Jack Kent Cook's hands. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when you worked with the Boston Globe, uh, that movie Spotlight. Do uh, uh, you think that was fairly accurate with their investigative journalism team? That that terrific at the Boston Globe. I do, and I really lament it. Uh, when I was at the Globe was when the Spotlight started, but the one um, and I went to Boston College, you know. So you know, I I mean, Jesuit education is a great thing, but but the whole event started yeah. in. Boston, and of course, it revealed it around the world. But no, that spotlight team is completely independent of the paper. They um, they only take editorial advice from each other, and they present the product at the end. And you know, it's a little bit. Um, the famous editor of the Boston Globe when I was there was a guy Tom Winship, and his roommate at Harvard had been Ben Bradley. Wow. So you know, we were our newsroom looked just like all the president's men. They were you know, great friends, Bill Bradley and Tom Winship. And so I sort of grew up in that all the president's men ethic. You said Bill Bradley, this is the same name. As, but yeah, she said, you said, but she said, I think she said Bill Bradley, which oh. leads me to the oh. New York oh. Knicks. Oh, of course. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Confusing my Bradleys. Yeah, yeah. But lead, leads me to the New York Knicks. And uh, Bill Bradley is a great guy. You've met him, I'm sure. Senator Bradley. I I did. You know, I got, yeah, of course it was Ben Bradley, um, who was Winship's roommate. But, oh, well, another Ivy Leaguer, Bill Bradley. One time I asked him, who is harder to please, the fans or your constituents? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> And he said, that's really hard. But, you know, Bill Bradley said one of the greatest things that I've ever heard. He said, the locker room is the ultimate laboratory. Because, I mean, look at that team. DeBusher was the son of a saloon owner. You know, Bill Bradley was middle class from Missouri. Uh, you know, w one guy was from the South, one guy Eastern Illinois. Willis Reed, another. So I think, um, you know, I think he was right that the locker room crosses a lot of rivers. Yep. We, uh, we got, I got fairly close with Bill back in the early 90s, and he invited us to D.C., and so we went, my wife and I, and my, my little daughter, who was seven years old. So he was nice enough to uh, let us spend some time with him in his office. And it was, it was the time he was thinking about running for president. And, of course, my seven-year-old daughter says, are you going to run for president? <laughs> Good. <laughs> the, Frank, tell me, where, tell me where sports was for you growing up. Oh, it was everything. Sports and television were my life. Uh, you know, uh, I watched what teams? the Yankees in, 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 in the fifties. Well, we, you know, you have to win championships if you're going to play sports. So, whoa, the, the Yankees. <laughs> and that would be, and that would be why Bill Russell is de facto better than Wilt Chamberlain. I got it. Thank you. You, got an argument. you can I, make an argument. I got it. I, they, they're lucky. They were both on this. We're both. That the, the, no, nobody ever swung a trade for R Russell for Chamberlain. So if if that my feeling is that they made the, if anybody ever made the trade, Wilt would have ten championships and Russell would have two. But that's 
a story for another day. But, but tell me about, you know, when you grew up, were the Dodgers still there? Were the, were the Giants in the Polo Grounds? Yeah. I mean, what was the baseball scene when you grew up? Mickey, Willie, and the Duke. And, uh -huh. I, you know, <laughs> I was in 57, the Dodgers and the Giants moved. So I never went to Ebbets Field, but I went to the Polo Grounds once. And I told this last week, I believe. I went to the Polo Grounds once. Al Dark hit two home runs in four innings. He hit two home runs, and it got rain and the game got rained out, and Al Dark lost those two home runs. But uh, <laughs> well, I was baseball in New York. But I mean, that must have been such a blast. My former husband, the great Dick Stockton, he grew up listening to the Giants, and so every was it October second or October third? October third. Uh, Dick and I would have to go up to where the Polo Grounds used to be, and he would tell me the whole story. Willie Mays was on deck, <laughs> Branca and Thompson, <laughs> Giants Shot her around up. the world. Well, you know, you know what October first was famous for, right? The Red Sox season would end. Whoa! Another, <laughs> another low blow. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you, the Red Sox of my childhood were terrible. Frank Malzahn a third. Yeah, it was, and well, Pinky and Higgins I loved Ike Ike DeLock. No, our, our manager was Pinky, 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 Pinky Higgins. Yes, what I just said, Pinky Higgins. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, ridiculous. And I loved Ike DeLock, a journeyman pitcher. You know, I have no idea. But um, Ike DeLock, I think he must have waved at me once, you know, in the bleachers or something. Uh, Felix Mantilla, <laughs> Dick Stewart. Well, they did have Mambo Cat, you know, and Pearsall. Yeah. And that was, like, that, okay. That, but no, they were terrible. And one time I think they only drew... Like fifteen hundred people for a game against Cleveland. Wow, oh, very terrible. Wow. I was at the Met game when Pearsall hit his hundredth home run. And he ran around the bases backwards. I'll never forget <laughs> that. Is it? There's another beauty, Jimmy Pearsall. Jimmy Pearsall. Yeah, fierce strikes out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Those great Nick teams, though, you were talking about before with Bradley on it. I used to go down to Garden all the time. It was electric. Marv Alpert, of course, was calling the game, and uh, you know the, the Busher and and Reed and just. Earl of Pearl, Clyde, uh, that was chemistry. And uh, Red had them playing ball, too. They had them playing like college teams. And, and you know you, what you mentioned yeah. in your book about UF? Well, uh, when Billy was coaching UF, I was at UF in those two years when they won the championships. Uh, Billy Donovan? Billy Donovan, yeah. When I, Billy, Don Billy Donovan, oh, my God, I, I talked to him. I'm going to have to remember you to him. But I first met Billy Donovan when Rick Pitino – had him at Providence, and the only reason he had him was because Rick is, as you guys probably know, uh, a gambler, a horse gambler, and um, he would be at Saratoga, and Billy's dad was a big uh, gambler at Saratoga, and so Billy, you know, Billy was a nice little player from Long Island, and then he went up to Providence, and Rick Patino totally embarrassed him. You're so fat, you're so useless, <laughs> and oh. so Billy. <laughs> Billy, you know, really got it together, and then Rick had him on the Knicks. And yeah, I think he, I think Billy Donovan's the most underrated college basketball coach in history. Back to back titles. He did win back to back titles for sure. Well, he, what was he there? Twelve years, and he won two championships, or ten years, and he won two championships. And now he's doing, yeah. he's doing a great job in the NBA. He's doing a great. Yes, he he's, he's he's got a great temperament, and um, I think his dad, know, his, his dad might have been general manager at the Knicks at one time. I, I believe his whole. Oh really? Yeah, I believe. Wow. That. Yeah, I think his general his dad was general manager of the Knicks at one time. His whole background is basketball. So Billy Donovan lived basketball. You mentioned Gal they were they were. You That's what. Remember Al McGuire. Oh, Al oh, McGuire sure. always away. said. Al McGuire always said he just wanted gym rats. Like he he didn't want guys who had grass in the backyard. He wanted guys that had cracked sidewalks in the front. McGuire was an Irish legend out in Rockaway. I mean, they owned bars, and uh, they McGuire's were like. Uh, you know, they, they were a big deal. We used to call that Rockaway the Irish Riviera. Yeah, he would, he, <laughs> tell me this. Uh, tell me, Billy. One, I got to, I mean, I covered Al McGuire's teams, and then I got to work with him. He worked for a while at CBS. But tell me this. He said that at that bar, that um, if if it got too quiet, that they would turn the heat up and start a fight just to get <laughs> the action going. It <laughs> sounds like the Irish to me. <laughs> Better than me, Leslie, but it sounds like an Irishman to me. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite Al McGuire line was when he said, um, Kamikaze pilots, I don't get it. Why do they wear helmets? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, who are your favorite announcers? I mean, I, I'm lucky because for 67 years of my life, 
Vin Scully was all I heard for the Dodgers. Uh, who, what are your feelings on Vin Scully and other broadcasters that you've grown uh, up with and worked with? I have a, I have a million opinions on this. Um, like you with Vin Scully. Um, uh, by the way, how great is it when he says, so pull up a chair. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's just such a, you know, Mount Rushmore. Um, but I grew up with Kirk Gowdy. So there I was with my cheap transistor. I think whether the Motorola's or Panasonic's, what did we have? Our cheap transistors. And, you know, it was Kirk Gowdy. Hi, neighbor. Have a Gansett. You know, the cowboy from Wyoming calling the Red Sox. So um, I really, uh, you know, I was trained on great announcers. And um, I wanted to be a sports writer. But when I got to TV, I've had the privilege. I think I've worked with quite a few of the greats. I, I've worked with Dick Enberg, and I did uh, Monday Night Football, the World Series, and the Triple Crown with Al Michaels. And uh, I've worked with Brent Musburger and James Brown and Greg Gumbel and really all of them. So, um, and Dick, I even did games with, with Dick, you know, quite a few uh, football and baseball games. So I think um, if there's anybody that, Jim Nance is terrific. He makes it look so easy. You know, Jim Nance on golf, I think is the best he's, there ever was. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. He make, and, he, and then he can the two younger him. ones, Ian Eagle is a scream. You guys should try to get him on. He's a riot. His father was, remember the IBM commercials, Dominic the Fryer? Okay. The fat fryer? I, I, I'll, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you did. You saw IBM machines sure. and the fat fryer sure. would walk around it. And that's Ian Eagle's father. So he's funny. I am funny. <laughs> so you love sports all, and you love journalism. That was it. That was it. And you were lucky enough to combine the two for a tremendous, unbelievable career. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I I have a natural curiosity. I really want to know, you know, what athletes are saying or thinking. I love competition. I've always said that I think sports is the great meritocracy because it doesn't matter where your mother went to college or how much money your father has, you know, you sink the jumper and you hit the jumper, you sink the putt. And that's what I love about it. People come from all different walks of life and they're all together for something that's fun. I can't believe that I've you know, been able to do this for 45 years. Well, we hope you're going to be doing it for 45 more. That's for sure. But that sounds like a sign off, but I'm not in the industry. No, no, no. I'm not no, letting to get away that easy. No, 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 no. <laughs> Tell us about the commercial, the big commercial, the Super Bowl commercial with the Larry Bird and Michael Jordan. Oh, that was, um, God, it was like uh, an exhilarating but kind of terrible experience <laughs> because, um, well, here's how it first happened. Uh, it was the Super Bowl in 95 uh, down in Miami at, uh, what was it called then? Joe Robbie Stadium. And um, so they called me from Leo Burnett. Probably, Frank, you know them. The big I do advertising know advertising agency. agency in Chicago, right? Right, in Chicago. So they called me up and they said, Leslie, would you like to be in a Super Bowl commercial with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird for McDonald's? And I said, are you kidding? I'll pay you. <laughs> <laughs> so my agent said, "Well, that's nice. That cost you about a hundred thousand." <laughs> so um, they rented out. They had so much money, right? The McDonald's yep. Corporation. Yep. They rented out uh, the Orange Bowl, painted it to look like Joe Robbie. Had all those fans in. You know, they just sent out an open invitation. And it was, if people remember, it was when Larry and Michael played horse. Right. So yep. their line was. Um, uh, let me see. Larry said, uh, oh, yeah, it was Larry's line. Okay, Michael, through the goalposts, around the bench, of Les Vistas' head. Cut. <laughs> because he couldn't say my name. I mean, I'd known the guy for 20 years, right? And, and cut. And what they did was they bounced a basketball that was half Nerf and half real off my head every time I was standing on the sideline. And um, every time. So it would be, okay, Michael. Through the goalposts, around the bench. Elizabeth is it. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> you should have worn your, your, your skateboard helmet. <laughs> God, yes. Yes. No, it was really an honor. People still though, talk you know, about that commercial. That was an amazing commercial. I think it was one of the more popular. You know, oh, without a doubt. It, it just was. And they let me add Libeline, which is so Boston. Um, you guys will get it. So 
uh, it has the characters coming, not Michael and, and uh, Larry, but these two guys who were trying to get tickets and Michael gave them to them. And so they're walking and they come through the team on the field and then they come near me and cut right in front of me. And so they said, Leslie just said, live something. So, I, so they walked past me and I went, what was that? <laughs> Which is like totally Boston humor. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the 50s and 60s, I can remember vividly. Guys on the street would say to you, you know, who, sports, what are you doing? How the Giants do last night, whatever. But they'd always say to you, what are you reading? What are you reading? And that question I never hear asked anymore from anybody young. And it blew me away when Dick Enberg asked you that. It so, did. And um, now uh, I'll tell you, we know all the readers. Uh, ben Scully, tremendous reader. You can ask that to Ben. He'll have a, a whole line of uh, Greg Gumbel. And so if you ask me, I'm reading a book called The Warmth of Other Suns which is about the great migration, the African-American migration from the South to Detroit, you know, of course, the music to Memphis, Detroit and Chicago, and also out to Oakland. And um, yeah, yeah, I always, uh, you know, sometimes now young people, you know, you'll ask them, and sometimes they look at you like you're accusing them of child molestation. Or yeah, no, you know? I never hear that question asked, and I, I see your library behind you, and I know that's not for ostentation. I know you said in your book, I read, and I mean anything. I will read anything. And Obviously, yeah, this is even our two books. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this isn't even my bookcase. My bookcase is over there, but um, you know, you have to have the perfect backdrop for zooms. <laughs> <laughs> but what I do have, and I'll put you guys in here. I have all my friends' books. I have oh, Shaughnessy's well, books and Ryan's honor. books and An Chris honor. Brennan and Amy Trask, and yeah. So I'm going to put yours because you know people look sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about bars. You know how, Billy? Why don't you tell Leslie where you got the idea for Lamar's Gamble? Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I was just came back from Nam. I was, uh, I guess, twenty two years old, and and uh, two years earlier was the upset, the big Jets upset over the Colts, and uh, I had a buddy of mine who I went to school with, actually Art Donovan, Fats O Donovan, who wrote his book from Boston College. College. <laughs> Did he go to BC? Really? Well, yes. high school and grammar school, he went in the Bronx. He went to St. Philip Neary High School, grammar school, and Mount St. Michael High School. And uh, I think he went to the Seabees for a while, too. I think he, World War II, he was a Seabee. Pretty sure. But in either case, I went to school with his nephew. I, I went to grammar school with his nephew. When I get back from Nam, and it was a Saturday morning. I get a call about 1030 in the morning. He said, Billy, are you back from, yeah, I'm back from overseas. He goes, hey, how'd you like to meet my Uncle Artie? I says, Art Donovan, are you crazy? I says, sure, I'd like to meet Art Donovan. Well, he's having a couple of beers up at the Idle Hour. He says, uh, come on up. And it was about six block walk. Of course, I saddled my fastest horse, went up there, and uh, I walk in at 10.30 in the morning. Maybe there's three guys in the place. And Art Donovan had his hand around. I know you don't go back as far as me. I know that. But they used to have these seven-ounce pilsners. And they used 15 cents was a seven ounce pilsner. And every three, they'd buy you one. So for 45 cents, you could get four beers. And he had, his, <laughs> he had his hand around it and it looked like a shot glass. You know, his hand was so big. And he was adamant, screaming on a rant. I'm telling you, that game was fixed. Rosa Bloom gave the Jets a playbook. No way they could have beat us. And they said, eh, yeah, that's all sour grapes, you know. But, but I was still in the presence of Art Donovan at 11 o'clock in the morning in a saloon, and I was happy enough to be in a saloon no matter who was there, in them <laughs> days especially. <laughs> and then I well, I'll tell you, Art Donovan, how stupid was I? So when I was got out of Boston College, I was pretty involved at Boston College. By the way, you know how you can survive things um, in college? And Billy, I have to sit down with you and hear what it was like to go to college in your, were you in your 50s? Well, later. Six, 60s, <laughs> 60s when he graduated. 62 60s. when he graduated. It was it was great, Leslie. Uh, I mean, it was great. They say college is your best years, and you know they say that to all collegiate kids. Well, I can tell you at 61 and 62 graduating, those four years was some of the best four years I've had in my life. It was great. Yeah. It's, I uh, went to journalism yeah. school. I mean, every, every kid was looking for of a story. Course. Every kid of came course. up to me. I had a fedora, the book he had. <laughs> this guy's got to be a story. What are you doing here? You know, so it was, it was great. I had a ball. God, you are a movie. But when I got out of Boston College, I was very involved in the school. Um, my sports editor was Mike Lupica. I guess I survived right. it. But yes, yeah. Mike Lupica was the sports editor. But, you know, I was a cheerleader. I did the whole thing. And so when I was 
out of school writing for the Globe. I ran for some Boston College postgraduate office or something, and I ran against Artie Donovan. So, I mean, it was like 33,000 votes to one. <laughs> and he wasn't going to work hard. I was going to work hard. Artie Donovan was just going to come up, you know, and tell stories. Wow. But yes, he's a legend. Oh, yeah. And great on all the talk shows. Always has a, a, a tremendous amount of stories, Artie Donovan. My two favorite Carson interviews were Don Rickles whenever he was on and Art Donovan whenever he was on. That's it. Who's that? <laughs> Well, I went to see uh, Carson one time, and um, it was it was astonishing just how professional he was and how he just turned it on. You know, he the line went on forever. We were out in Burbank. Frankie must have been there a million times. And then, you know, he stub his cigarette out, sort of look at Doc Severinsen, and then the light went on, and it was the best. Wasn't he the best ever? He was the best ever. I think a lot of people say that about you, Leslie. I think it could be said. <laughs> A real pro. But I love the idea that you read anything because I always heard and read that if you don't have time to read, you don't have time to write. you got to read. you got to read everything. you got to be very Well, there are, there are a couple of things about that. Thank you for that. Uh, one, uh, the more you read, if you read anything, you'll have um, analogies or perspective. I mean, if you read about Japanese architecture or flowers in the Dominican Republic, you know, you can, it gives you something. And also, uh, it was Hemingway who said the secret of writing is rewriting. So uh, you just, I don't know, you learn so much. Are you guys more Hemingway or Fitzgerald? Definitely Hemingway. We like it Hemingway. short and sweet. Subject, verb, object, gone. Subject, verb, object, <laughs> yes! gone. See you later. I mean, that was Hemingway. I mean, that was, uh, and, and again, that I, generation was before me. The Pete, Pete Hamill generation really worshipped Hemingway, you know. They were about 10 years before my time. But I liked Hemingway. I mean, I, I loved Hemingway. But Leslie, you oh, said, I love Hemingway. Leslie, you said all writing is rewriting, but you grew up in the Boston Globe, and you had one shot when you were writing on Deadline. You wrote it, and then you you called it in. You, you called it in. Uh, there was not a lot of rewriting done at the Boston Globe. Those guys were those guys and gals were so proficient at writing they got it right the first time. Uh, thank you. Well, the Globe, everything. People say to me, didn't you used to be a writer? I say, no, a writer is the greatest thing I ever will be or have been. Wow. But it was, we were a writer's paper. We always won the best sports section in the country. Sports Illustrated named the 10 years I was there, not because of me, but they named us the greatest sports section of all time. And that's because uh, they were all Hall of Famers. It was Peter Gammons on baseball, Bob Ryan on basketball, Bud Collins on tennis, and Will McDonough on football. And I used to get to go to all those events with those guys. I, w I was always like a second writer. And I remember at Wimbledon uh, with Bud, I mean, I just used to go around and say, hi, I'm Leslie Visser from the Boston Globe. I work with Bud Collins. And it'd be, you know, really grumpy people like Ian Tyriac saying, oh, what do you need? What do you need? You know, Bud Collins. But back then, there were so few Americans, uh, this is in the mid-70s, covering Wimbledon, that they called us the Colonials, and we had to send our copy by Western Union. And Bud, you know, Bud Collins was crazy, and Bud would try to get things in. Like one time, he said, uh, the uh, teenage girls in the audience, when Bjorn was playing, Bud wrote, the teenage girls in the audience went into screaming borgasms. <laughs> <laughs> and Western Union wouldn't send it. It's it's like, we don't cotton to, that brings don't me cotton to the Dorothy to Parker quote. I, and I thought I read every Dorothy Parker quote. I thought I knew them all. But you had the one about her breaking her arm, sliding down her barrister. Wasn't it the greatest? Sliding hey, down a barrister. Favorite, you know? My favorite uh, is, is, she said, whenever yeah. I go to a party, I, I only drink one or two. After three, I'm under the table. After oh, I, I one or two at the most. After three, I'm under the table. After four, I'm under the host. <laughs> <laughs> That's by the way, Billy. You are so special. You have to memorize that because it is the second. It's the greatest. Oh, it's a great. Quote. You know, people say stand thing. up and give a toast, and that's the greatest. <laughs> and, great uh, you know, whoever it is. Mike loves to have a martini. Oh, usually it's better for a girl. Okay. <laughs> Linda loves to we have a martini. Up, we, end, we hope to end up under the host. We'd be delighted. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, she, she was something else. Yeah, Tallulah Bankhead was another one. She wasn't as glib as Dorothy Parker, but great stories from her. I, I've read a lot of quotes. And wasn't, 
Wasn't she on the Dodger games? Remember, she did a season. Did she? Tallulah really? Bankhead. Really? I'm pretty sure. Wow. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to tell you a Tallulah Bankhead story that's a little bit off color, but uh, Grouch, uh, Chico Marx was infatuated with her. <laughs> and he walked up to her one day and he said, Boy, I'd like to screw you. Right. And she said, And so you shall, my dear man. So you shall. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I, it's like favorite. all those Ch Churchill ones, right? Uh, Lady Astor to him, Sir Churchill, you are drunk. And he said, Lady Astor, in the morning I'll be sober and you'll still be unattractive. <laughs> <laughs> they, they went out at Churchill and Lady Astor. Yeah. Yeah, she said, I, Mr. Churchill, I don't like your mustache and I don't like your politics. He says, Madam, it's very unlikely you'll come in contact with either. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah. Um, they went out no, you know, what happened to the art of repartee and badinage? Really, what happened to it? Well, I don't know what badinage is, but uh, I'm going to guess it's pretty... <laughs> pretty. Don't sound good. Don't it's sound like, good. I didn't know what a mook was either, according to Robin Nero, but it don't sound good. <laughs> no, it's just badinage. Yeah. It's just another word for verbal play. Yeah. But tell me, Frank, who wrote Murphy Brown? Because that's that's was genius. Yeah. Diane English. Diane oh, English. And, and I'll tell you, the first uh, the pilot was written during a writer strike, so she put a first draft on the table, and. We usually have a battalion of writers punch it up. Nobody punched up that first episode. And we shot it uh, and it won four Emmys and was nominated for seven. One of the three we lost was for Best Comedy Show, which was I, was my category. But that just set up along the line of losing Emmy awards for me. <laughs> well, you were there, wait, didn't, when they revived it, did you work on that one? I did. So 30 years later... Uh, 30 years after the pilot, Diane English calls me and we had a conversation. I, I sent Diane a note of congratulations and then she called me and she said, it's too bad we're, we're shooting in New York. And I said, who said I won't go to New York? After I talked to my wife, of course, I said, who said I won't go to New York? And she said, Peter Ross office, who was the president of Warner Brothers TV at the time, will be in touch tomorrow. And I went off and I had the greatest experience uh, doing those 13 episodes. We went out to dinner. Uh, one night in New York, and it was myself, uh, Diane, Candace, uh, and our costume designer who was 78. I don't remember her name now. Uh, Pat Patricia Norris. And uh, I, I said to myself, look at this. I'm the youngest person in the group because <laughs> Diane was 70, uh, Candace was 72, and Pat was uh, 76 or so. Uh, but it was a, a great great time. We shot at a Kaufman Astoria Studios in Queens. And uh, every night, every show night was a party. We had Bette Midler on. We had John LaRiquette on. We had all of these people that were just coming to be with Candace. And uh, the cast, was, Joe, Joe Regalbudo. Were some, people, were some people asking their agent, can you get me on? Like, was that oh, the thing to do? I, I'm sure. Bette Midler doesn't have to ask anybody to be out, but you know, a lot of people uh, were probably lining up to get on that show. How many people watched that Dan Quayle episode? <sighs> Thirty. Well, it was. I think it made sixty million. Sixty million people. Yeah, something like that. Sixty million. Those are Super Bowl numbers, there, <laughs> Leslie. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, that's the one thing, at least right now, about sports is. I um, mean. You know, I'd love to hear what you guys are watching on Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, whatever. But sports still brings, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you just watched that Field of Dreams game. Did you see the ratings on that? We talked about it for, for a little while before you came on. I, got, I guess they got a five, uh, they got a 5.9 rating, which was the highest rating of a baseball game in 16 years. The Hall of Fame game draw a 7.2. Yeah, it uh, it was just perfect, wasn't it? And you, I'm sure you've gotten to know. I've privileged to have gotten to know Kevin Costner over the years, and I just thought it was magical. And he he let the scene speak. He didn't try to act like an actor at all. I mean, you'd see it, Frank, but was it pretty perfect? It was pretty perfect. It was pretty perfect. 
uh, you know, even even the game itself was Amazing. perfect. Yeah. The ninth inning, the Yankees go score four runs to go ahead, and then Timmy Anderson hits the home run in the bottom of the ninth walk off. I mean, it, it was perfect. It was amazing. Yeah, the ending was like the natural. <laughs> it, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was like the natural. Um, you talk about what what are you watching on net on on TV? What are you yeah. watching? I went through most of them. I loved Homeland. I loved Billions. Um, you know, I can't get. Uh, I don't like to say the word the the um, Shit's Creek. I mean, yeah, what am I, I missing that. there? Is that great? Uh, I thought it was great. Really? I yeah. Don't get that. And I don't. You know, I, I've never seen a full episode of Friends. I've never seen a full episode of Seinfeld because you know of of Schwimmer and uh, Costanza. Those two, those two guys drive me crazy, but uh, you know I, I like Schitt's Creek. I like Ted Lasso. I just he's great. I'm I'm coming off Animal Kingdom now, uh, which is a, a terrific show. Um, so that's what is I'm that watching. the one where the guy tortures the tigers? No, no, no. That was uh, oh. not not Animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom's like the Sopranos of surfing. Oh really? Yeah, it's Ooh. it's it stars a. Uh, Ellen Barkin as Tony Soprano. She plays <laughs> Ellen Barkin plays Tony Soprano, and her four her four sons uh, are her gang. I, I got to check that out. I just finished watching a, a remake of Joseph Heller's classic Catch Twenty Two, and George Clooney produced it. It's on Hulu, and I got to tell you, it, six really, episodes, it's good. It's better than the original movie by far. <laughs> Who plays Milo Minderbender? <laughs> yeah, right there. You, I, you, you should play Milo Minderbender. You know what? The guy who was a real wheel of dealer. I mean, it was it was terrific. I thought that it was a great cast and uh, really well done. Uh, I think it was better than the original movie. I really do. Billy, I, I'd love to see you on camera. The way you talk now, I'm, I'm sure if we, we put you on screen at the moment they said action. I would get a hamana 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 hamana. Can, can, can it open up? Can, can it open a can? <laughs> yeah, but Jackie Gleason became one of the five greatest stars of all time from that. So that. don't you worry, Billy. You just say it. You think it's too late? 73? Do I still got a shot? You think I can start my modeling career, Leslie? No, you could have a, a romance with Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jackie Gleason was a great star. And, you know, what I love about the honeymooners is that was the, the show was set in one set. There was yeah. uh, it was a show about a love affair between a man and a wife. Uh, Audrey Meadows, one room. one room. Occasionally, they would go up to the Nortons on the second floor, but it was so story driven. It was story driven, not action driven, and that's you know to me what's wrong with some of these shows today. Is everything is about what's going on in the in the periphery, and it's not enough about story. But that's just me. yeah, yeah. Like to me, the best movies of the last ten, fifteen years were show were movies like uh, Something's Got to Give, or um, which is the one that Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson, and she writes the. Um, yes, I know what you mean. I just, uh, I that's know. Something's Got to Give. Yeah, or is that the one with Helen Hunt? And those three, you know, people you never put together, right? Greg Kinnear plays um, the gay guy who, get, who gets beat up. And Helen Hunt is just trying to make enough money to put food on the table. And Jack Nicholson has the ADD. What's that thing? I don't, um, I don't remember the name of it, but I know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, I know the one, too. Yeah, that's uh, when the yeah, kids are that real, was a great movie, a real though. miserable son of a gun in it. And, uh, and finally, he looks at her one day and says, you make me want to be a better person, which is probably the nicest yes. thing he could ever say. Yeah. Yeah. And you I've, been, I've been around coaches like that that they or people like they just make you sit up straighter, you know that. Um, <laughs> like the, I guess not today. <laughs> well, the Boston Catholic school training, sit up straighter. <laughs> well, that's like Nick Saban's one of those people. Nick Saban and Bill Belichick. Now you know they're both so accomplished. But what do you think they talk about? Well, they talked about. They did a special on them. Oh, uh, ESPN, I think, did a special on them. They did Belichick and uh, Nick Saban, and they talked about what? Their, their, love of, their love of football, their love of, of, their love of the basics. I mean, I, I was surprising that Belichick was so outspoken on it. It was sort of like uh, years before Madden, and I forget who was, was Madden's co-host, but they were. Oh, Summerall, Madden and Summerall? Yeah, yeah. They, were, they did a special on them, too. 
Yeah, I mean, you know who you, you could ask that question of Armin Katayan, our good friend who worked. We with, love Armin, don't we? Yeah. And you did the book with him, right? Didn't you do a book with him? I hired Armin when he was 27 years old, and he worked with me in uh, San Diego Advertising Agency. I've known Ar oh. I've known Armin for that year, that that long, and we did we did a, Armin's second Armin's first book was a racquetball book with Dave Peck. <laughs> And Armin's second book was the Rod Carew hitting book that he and I did together in 80, 85. Do you know that I had to cover, I've had to just cover everything. I covered the national racquetball finals that were in La Jolla. And do you think you were there in like 77? And we got to stay at that Valencia, you know, and it was, uh, and then, and I played racquetball myself. I used to play uh, with Will McDonough, who would play with Red Auerbach all the time. And, um, I, I just, uh, I thought Armin was a joy to work with. You know, he's um, he's strong. He was an athlete. He's so smart. He's so uh, well-spoken and he could write great things. But um, I remember, uh, who are we talking about? Not Madden and Summerall. Oh, Belichick and um, Nick Saban. Saban. Uh, Belichick, I once, he let me do a story with him. Belichick's hero in life was Joe Bellino. Of course, oh, the Heisman Navy. Trophy winner from sure. Right, from Naval Academy, which um, Steve Belichick, uh, his dad, Bill's dad, coached for, what, 28 years or something. So Bill said, okay, I'll do it. And so we did the story up in Foxborough, and Joe Bellino was there. And I had a whiteboard with me behind my chair, and I pulled it out, and I said, Bill, could you diagram a play from Joe Bellino from back at the Naval Academy, which was when Bill Belichick was six years old? He wrote it down on the whiteboard in five seconds, you know, 27 F trap, touchdown, Joe Bellino. And he held it up like he was, you know, like in grammar school, like, oh, I did this. It was astonishing. His brain in 10 wow. seconds did that. Yeah, it's funny how people have minds for certain things. Uh, I, can, I can remember when I was a kid with Bellino. I think the thing was he had 18 inch calves or something. That was the, everybody <laughs> talked about his calves, the size of his calves. But you have a quote in the book about Belichick that I found remarkable. I don't know if it's your quote or you were quoting somebody else, but you were talking about Belichick. You said, it's not that he doesn't care. It's that he doesn't care if you care, <laughs> which I thought was a great quote. Is that yours? Uh, I, I'm a, I probably was quoting someone, but I yeah. can feel it because he, you know, he was a prep school kid, right? I mean, after going to high school uh, down in Annapolis, he went a year at Exeter or Andover. I think it was Andover. And his best friend was a military a naval uh, expert on uh, naval, Navy and the military, uh, Adams, who went to work with Bill for 40 years, just retired last year. And so Bill actually, you know, he had, he had preppy in him and he belongs, you know, to the most exclusive club out on Nantucket and he rides his bike around. So, and you guys probably know this. He's a roadie for Bon Jovi in the summer. Wow. I didn't know that. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Wow. Imagine that. Bill Belichick's your roadie. Yeah. I know. Can you imagine, Unbelievable. Can you imagine telling him to pick up those guitar cases and put hey, them in the car? Hey, kid, grab those lights. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. and, and you also covered horse racing. You covered Triple Crown? I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. Billy, I'm sure you've been to them. And it was a blast. And Al Michaels, you know, everybody's a handicapper. And uh, it was it was um, tremendous. And it was a lot of the Triple Crown during the Triple Crown. Well, uh, some contenders, Silver Charm, but it was real quiet. It was Silver Charm. Charismatic came within a nose wow. of winning. So, um, yeah, it was really, uh, it was really fun. And I actually named a horse that got to the Derby, which is pretty unusual. I think there are 20,000 foals born every year. And what, 2018, get to the Kentucky yeah. Derby. And do you guys remember the book Lonesome Dove? Sure, sure. Is, yeah, great movie. Great Robert movie, Duvall. Right? Great movie. Yes, Robert Duvall. And, well, in the, um, in the, in in the movie. TV yeah. series. Yeah. But um, so uh, it was, what was his name? Um, Larry. McMurtry, McMurtry. did right. he write it? Yep. Yes, he did. So anyway, so I was good friends with Wayne Lucas, the trainer, and you know he always had a million uh, foals or uh, babies being born, and he said, you know, give me some names. So I sort of imagined these names out of Lonesome Dove, and I said to him, what about the name Border Run? And he took it, and that horse ran in the Kentucky Derby in like ninety four. <laughs> wow! Another you still, feather. Do you still have your bonnet? Oh, I have all the derby hats. I had a great experience with that. Um, 
let's see, I've had two great experiences. One was the first derby I did for uh, ABC. Um, uh, I ran into Phyllis George, you know, the great Phyllis George, who I followed on the NFL today. And Phyllis said to me, um, maybe you guys met her, she was just what you think, beautiful, charming, Southern, uh, smart. And she looked at me and she said, oh, darling, that hat of yours. You know, I had on some, <laughs> like something Billy would wear, some fedora <laughs> thing, you know. <laughs> and, um, and Phyllis said to me, you cannot wear that on network television. And she made me switch with her hat. Wow, that's, that's a great cool story. One of the most hilarious features I ever read was Hunter Thompson at the Kentucky Derby. That's an amazing, ah. an amazing piece. Hilarious. Well, you talk about things that go around Phyllis George, uh, uh, in, in addition to being the NFL host, her husband and she also owned Artist Gilmore's Kentucky Colonels. Yes, and then he came uh, to the Boston Celtics, which was very unfortunate because – Phyllis had a crush on some player, and, and John Y. to impress her, I mean, no, it wasn't Lanier. It was, uh, it was somebody that she just loved and didn't work out at all, and I think he only owned the team for a year. I think it was like a disaster. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Phyllis was – hey, was Jimmy O'Brien on that team? I think he was. The up, Kentucky Colonels? I think he was. I believe, yeah. I believe he was. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, that, and yeah. Maybe Billy Evans. I don't know if he was. But, um, and artists, is ba yeah. artists used to babysit. For the general manager of the colonel's daughter, Hannah Storm. <laughs> wow! Right, right, Storm. Right, yep. she's great too. By the way, she is she, terrific. You know how you guys find out you can tell the women that are the real deal. And Hannah's one, Michelle Tafoya. We have one, Tracy Wolfson at CBS. And you know you guys should get on sometime because she's a blast. Is Susan Waldman? Now yeah. she can tell stories. I'm sure she can. Uh, Yankee stories for sure. We, well, she was an actress before that. She well, was in she, the original Man of La Mancha on uh, Broadway, yeah. and she uh, performed in the West End. She dated Cary Grant. Come on. Come on. That's saying something. I would date Cary Grant if I had a shot. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, last week's show, we had on Rob Nelson, who was the, oh, yeah. the pitcher who invented Big League Chew. With, with Jim Bouton, and, and Bouton financed his uh, venture into Big League Chew. So uh, we are meeting some amazing people in this podcast. Leslie, you, you've been delightful. Uh, we, we've taken up enough of your time because we could go on for, we can go on for almost as long as Upton went on. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's been, a, it's been a privilege. You know, I've, I, as I told you, Frank and Billy, um, when Upton said to me, he sent me the show, which was great. And he said, you ought to meet these guys. I said, Upton, I've been listening to them for months. So oh, thank you for finding me. And, such a compliment. And you, you, we actually, you and I had worked together 15 years ago on Hall of Fame magazine. So uh, I'm delighted to re remake your acquaintance for sure. Uh, Derek, do you have any final questions? Do you, uh, Billy, do you have any final questions? Yeah, I got a couple questions. Well, one question for sure is, uh, so you mentioned that you read a lot. And uh, what's your top three books for either women or women in journalism? My, my, daughter's, my daughter just graduated from, uh, well, North in West journalism. West. And I'm curious about, read. yeah, I'm curious about um, I, I wouldn't read books, how-to books. Okay. I would read any, I would read, they talked about read Hemingway, read, um, read writers like The Athletic. Get a subscription to The Athletic and see uh, you need three. I think there are three non-negotiables to make it in, in sports, either journalism or on camera. Uh, you have to have passion. You know, if you don't have passion, then it'll leak out. You'll be mad that somebody else makes more money or you won't like the assignment. So you have to have passion. You have to have knowledge. Knowledge is unassailable. And I think you have to have stamina. I mean, all of us here on this um, podcast right now uh we've all had ups and downs and um we've all gotten back up so i, I think if you have those three elements she'll make it awesome That's great advice and then i got i got one more question so you're super sharp and obviously a lot of it has to do with uh reading and and uh you know working what's your regimen so you look great as well so do you have a like a like a sort of a morning regimen do you work out uh what sort of what's your diet wow like? 
Thanks. Now, um, I would say, uh, yes, I've worked out my whole life. I have three hip replacements to show for it. I was uh, a runner that, you know, running was great because you could do it wherever. You could go out the door, you know, at a hotel in New Orleans and ride up, by, uh, run up to Audubon Park. You know, I've covered events in uh, Sweden and Switzerland and uh, Russia. So you could just go out the door, you know, with a headset on, those old Sony headsets and run. But um, I, I think it really helped me. I always played pickup basketball with either the guys from the Globe or the Patriots. And you guys remember Russ Francis, 6'6", pretty boy, right? Of course. And I would have to rebound because Russ didn't want his pretty nose elbowed. You know, so I said, yes, but you get in there. So, and by the way, one time, Frank, you'll appreciate this. One time, Russ Francis and Abe Gibbon and I went fishing before the game in Tampa Bay. You know, it was a lot more relaxed back then. Uh, we actually flew with the team. But uh, Abe was a yeah. beauty. Abe was a beauty. And Russ Francis, he didn't want to get his nose broken, later became Correct. a professional wrestler. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I might remind him of that. But um, <laughs> thank you, Derek. I have terrible paranoia, you know, because that's uh, because I was always the only woman in the beginning. That's what everybody would say. Oh, what's with her hair? What's with her hair? You know, so. Um, but actually, one, one time I was doing skating. Uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, it was in the winter, and Peggy Fleming, I did it with the great Dick Button and Peggy Fleming, and Peggy said, Leslie, you got to come down to breakfast, you know, uh, you really have to come right now, and I went down, I said, Peggy, what's wrong, is your family okay, are your kids okay, and she said, there's a website about your hair, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Dad, for saying I look okay. That's awesome. Billy, any closing thoughts? No, but I, uh, I want to thank you for having us, uh, for me, just meeting you. It's been a pleasure. The stories have been amazing. You're amazing. Your book is great. And uh, like your husband says, uh, one more Pioneer Award for, for Leslie, you'd have to wear a coonskin cap. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll wear it on the next show. You certainly <laughs> broke a lot of glass ceilings. So well, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. An honor. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, guys. Very good having you. You're, you're a terrific lady and a great interview. Thank you so much. Thanks Goodbye. So much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. So pretty, another great interview. Yeah, she was amazing. Uh, she just uh, it, the, between the sports knowledge she has and the journalism knowledge she has, you know, meeting writers like that. I mean, just great, great stuff. You know, great stuff. It's terrific. So this week in uh, history, what do you think happened this week in history? <laughs> I don't even know what date it is. In 19, Give me a clue. In 1945. You want a visual cue? Derek, oh, give me a visual. A, yeah, give me a visual. Oh, well, that's easy. That's easy. That's MacArthur. That's uh, getting the surrender from the Japanese aboard the Missouri. Uh, matter of fact, Wainwright should be somewhere in that picture. He is. You can barely see him over uh, Hirohito's uh, right left shoulder. You see that skinny guy back there? That's Wainwright after his release from the Philippines. MacArthur wanted to be certain. Who's, who's Wainwright? Uh, General Wainwright was when MacArthur left Bataan, when the Japanese were taking over Bataan. MacArthur got out of there you know, because they thought he was too important to the war effort to lose to the Japanese. So they shot him out in a PT boat in the middle of the night. But Wainwright took command of Bataan, and he ended up spending almost three and a half years in a Japanese prison camp where he was, you know, predictably... As he was so skinny when he came out of there, he could have closed one eye and went to a masquerade party as a needle. I mean, I don't want to make fun of it, but it was right. that's the situation he was in. And MacArthur insisted that he be on the Missouri when the, the Japanese capitulated. Uh, MacArthur had an uncanny. Uh, there's a great book about MacArthur called American Caesar, written by William Manchester, and he said he had an uncanny accuracy when it came to predicting the amount of casualties. And he said a, a land invasion of Japan would he estimated would would, would, would lose America one million American soldiers. Wow. That's why they dropped the bomb. My brother was named after Douglas MacArthur. My brother Doug. Really? Yeah. Well, my fa my father was in the war, so he named my my two brothers, my brother Bruce after his general Bruce, who later became the president of the University of Houston, and Douglas MacArthur. Wow, that's quite an honor. I I always love MacArthur. I mean, uh, there's a in in Manchester's book American Caesar. He said that the th three of the most influential people in the Western effort, of course, were MacArthur, Churchill, and FDR, and they were all distant cousins. No, no. And they all had domineering mothers. That was another thing that uh, was kind of odd. Like when he went to West Point, MacArthur, 
And, and again, MacArthur graduated West Point with a 98.6 average, which I think was the second highest in the history of West Point. The only one who had a higher mark was Robert E. Lee. Right. Right. And somebody graduated at the bottom of the class. Wasn't somebody, was Eisenhower at the bottom of his class? Eisenhower was near the bottom of his class. So, like of course, Grant almost got thrown out. Yeah. Well, well I mean, you know, <laughs> you know what Grant's problem was. <laughs> it's a small fault of a good man, Frank. A small fault. He liked a few in the morning, just to, just to even them off a bit. So with, before we close, I want to mention Combustible. It's now our third book. Third book, collaborated book. That's loosely thing. based on a life of a screwball, some screwball, a, some screwball, Man unnamed. somebody named unnamed, named Billy O'Connor. <laughs> it's loosely based on his life. Uh, it culminates at nine eleven, uh, which we are coming up on, and we're going to commemorate that. But we thought it would be good. Uh, we had to work against the clock, but to get this book out now. Uh, because it's an important period of our important period of in our life, and it's the twenty year anniversary. The twentieth anniversary of nine eleven, and uh, it's hard to believe it's been twenty years. I mean, you know, no Tempest Fugit, you always say time flies, and but twenty years really since nine eleven. I mean, uh, what a tragic day. Yeah, and we'll talk about that with Richie Picciano. Richie Picciano will be on the show. Uh, uh, before Richie wrote a great book called Last Man Down yep. about about. He was one of the survivors, actually, of 9-11. So you talk about reading. You know, since we've been doing this, I've been reading more than ever because I'm reading Tony O's book because Tony O's going to be on again. I'm reading, you know. That's Sinatra's Road Manager, by the way. Sinatra's Road Manager will be on. He wrote a great book called In, In the Wee Small Hours of the Morning, Sinatra and Me. Uh, I'm reading Leslie's book. I'm reading, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of books. A lot of homework, Frank. A lot, a lot of, of homework. homework. You can't take it for granted. Uh, and I hope somebody... Uh, finds it in their in their graciousness to read if these lips could talk Lamar's gamble and our latest book combustible combustible and Tony O was such a great interview the first time he was here yeah so and he's going to have a lot more to talk about since now he's uh, got the book out some he's, pretty he's, explosive he's got, stuff in that book I'm uh, I'm reading it right now yeah pretty explosive stuff uh, before we go I want to again mention Weekend Coffee our sponsor they do a great job uh, there's. Derek's got the logo up right now. You go to weekendcoffeecompany.com. Uh, they will uh, donate one cup of one bag of coffee bag one, every ten for first responders and uh, veterans. So they're a good cause. They're good coffee, and uh, and it's good coffee, yeah. and they deliver it right to your door. Right to your door, and then you take it and put it into a cup and deliver it right to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's on you. They can't do everything. But thanks for looking in this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Leslie Visor. I had a ball. I hope that our audience had just as much fun as we did. What an interesting woman. Yep. A terrific woman. Yeah. Uh, another terrific woman because we had uh, Wendy Selig Prebaum. That's correct. A couple of weeks prior. So it's with all that, good, Frank, I'm meeting some great people. Thank you for the privilege. Say good night, Billy. Good night, Billy. Good night, Derek. Good night, fellas. Good night, good Jenny. Wherever you are. <laughs> Next week's guest co-star of NBC series New Amsterdam, Connor Marks.